Hi, I'm Kim Tolnar, and I'm a covenant member here at Image Church. Thanks so much for joining in with us this morning. If this is your first time with us, I want to invite you to text the word guest to the number on the screen so that someone can be in touch with you this week. We're grateful to be able to provide these online services and resources for you, and we pray that God will use them to impact your life. Image family, we want to thank you for being a generous church. It's your generosity that fuels our ability to continue the mission of the gospel. If you plan on giving today, you can do so securely at imageatl.com give or through our Image Church app. We want to stay connected with you. I want to invite you to go to imageatl.com and click the Stay Connected button to sign up for our weekly update so you can be informed on everything that's happening here at Image Church. Also, I want to invite you to take a second to click the word subscribe to join our Image Church YouTube page. Make sure to click the bell to get notification each time we post new content. Thanks again for joining with us today. Good morning, Image. Good morning, family. Uh, my name is Jesse, and uh, I just want to invite you this morning to just worship with us this morning as we declare that our hope is built on Jesus Christ. built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone Savior's love and through the storm He is Lord Lord of all When darkness seems to hide His face I rest on His unchanging grace Savior's love and through the storm. 
we thank you. We rest in that this morning. That you're not only our Savior, God, but we, we declare you as Lord, God. God, you are Lord over our lives, God. You're Lord over our salvation, God. You're Lord, God, of everything, God. God, your word says that the earth is yours and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein, God. So, God, we thank you that we can look to you as Lord. God, you are the Lord over our situations, God. You are the Lord over our finances, God. You're the Lord over COVID, God. God, you're the Lord over lack, God. And so we declare that this morning, God. And we thank you, God, that you are Lord of all, God. And we thank you that you alone, Christ. want to say a huge thank you to the COVID workers, the healthcare workers that are on the front lines of this crisis, especially to my wife, Erica. I've seen how hard that you've worked and, and the emotional drainage and the physical drainage that it's taken to love your people well, regardless of if they have the virus or not. You are, um, all of you are doing such an incredible job of, of loving well, despite the circumstances around you. Um, and we're super thankful for that because we're able to to be at home, we're able to do our jobs um, from home and, and not have to, to go through that same sort of fear as you are going through. And so we thank you for that and taking that on and uh, just being bold in the face of this crisis. Um, I wanna share something that we came across in the Psalms reading study in Psalms 11, verse three, it seems like David's at a teetering point. Um, and verse three says, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? And I'm sure we feel a bit like that. We're in the midst of a pandemic, uh, a global pandemic, and we feel like, what's the point of this little stuff that we're doing? But he finishes the chapter being reminded that the Lord is good, that the Lord is righteous, and then he keeps his, keeps his people. And so I just wanna encourage you guys with that. That's been an encouragement to us. Um, and just say thank you ultimately for all that you're doing, all that you will do. is 
Well, good morning, Image family and friends that are joining us. Hey, listen, I want to thank all of you that filled out the survey that we sent out through the weekly update. That was super helpful for us. Uh, And for those of you that haven't signed up for the weekly update yet, come on. We got to get you to sign up. We need you to sign up. We want you to sign up. Uh, It's the main line of communication that we want to have with you. We prioritize communication. So make sure that you do that. If you haven't done that, do it ASAP today because there's some important information we're going to be rolling out. Mainly, uh, the countdown's on for our phase two uh, plan for regathering. And so I'm really, really excited about this. This phase two, it's on the website. You can visit imageatl.com. And you can find out all the details there. But I do want to give you just a flyover of what this is going to look like because I'm really excited about it. And you will be too when you hear about it. What we're going to do is we're going to gather in homes. So we're going to have host homes that we're calling watch parties that'll be uh, hosted at these um, homes. And they're going to be groups of about 12 people that'll be getting together. We're going to be sharing a meal together. We're going to have some fellowship time together. And we're going to watch the online gathering uh, in these groups in these homes. Oh, the reason why I'm so excited about this is this is so much like Acts chapter 2, uh, and it's really, I believe, going to be a, a monumental time in the life of our church as we build relationships. We have smaller, safer spaces that we can control, um, spaces that we can sanitize. We're going to be giving boxes um, to these host homes each week. They're going to have cleaning supplies. They're going to have masks. Um, they're going to have different elements um, that allow us to be able to maintain um, safe social distancing protocol. All the homes that we're using are application-based, and that's to make sure that um, they're safe and they haven't been sick. And so uh, we'll be doing that as well. Also, some of these homes are going to be a place uh, where you can bring your kids. So certain host homes for these watch parties are going to have image kids. That's another awesome part of this. And uh, again, we're limiting those spaces um, for the purpose of being safe as possible. And so I'm really excited about this phase two uh, regathering plan for us. Here's what I need from you, and this is what I want to ask you to do. If you're interested in being a host home for these watch parties, I want you to go to imageatl.com slash watch party and fill out one of the applications so that you can become a host home. Also, if you're maybe like, I don't really want to be a a host home, but I'm interested in going to one of these watch parties, 
You can also go to imageatl.com slash watch party and you can uh, find the nearest watch party closest to you. And so there's a form that we have on there for you to be able to fill out and find the um, the host home with the watch party that's closest to you. And so make sure that you do that. Um, this is really going to be a unique time in the life of our church. But again, I believe it's going to be a, a special time in the life of our church. So July 19th is when we're going to be putting this stuff into effect. Again, it's on our website. We're going to be pushing it through social media and uh, our weekly update. Again, make sure you sign up for that. Um, but I want you to be prayed up, uh, be excited about this, and be ready um, to find the space nearest to you um, as we begin this kind of phase two toward uh, regathering and trusting the Lord with the future of all this um, in our city and in our nation with this whole um, COVID deal in the process. So stay tuned for updates and be ready for that on July 19th, okay? Well, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, and we made it there. We're in the last chapter here, and so we're we're pressing through. I'm really excited about this, um, this chapter. I think there's a lot of good stuff in it, and we're going to dive into the first part of this chapter today. We're going to be picking up in verse 1. Um, while you're turning there, I want to give you a little outline about what Paul's going to do. Um, he's about to show us the key uh, to practical and personal peace. Paul's going to lay out for us the keys to, to practical and personal peace peace, right? Practical as it relates to peace between one another and personal as it relates to our ability to experience peace in our own lives on a day-to-day basis. Now, I feel like peace is one of those things that's thrown out a lot. And oftentimes it's associated with a feeling and it's kind of ambiguous and people are like, yeah, man, I just really have a peace about that. And then they go and do it, you know, and uh, I can't tell you how many times people have come to me uh, with a horrible decision that they feel a peace about and they go and they do it anyway, right? People come all the time and it's like, man, you know, pastor, I think I'm going to do this, this, and this. And, you know, I just really feel a peace about this. And I'm like, that's funny because that goes against everything that God's word holds up. So it's funny that you'd have a peace about that. Uh, I had a friend of mine, who actually had a friend of his uh, that came up to him and he said, um, hey, listen, you know, I've really been praying about whether or not my fiance and I should move in together before we're married. uh, And we're going to go through with it because we really feel like we have a peace about it. And we're sitting there like, what? Wait a minute. Hold on just a second. Uh, So oftentimes people attach the peace to things that are unbiblical as well. And so it's just kind of a, a big mess as it relates to this whole idea of peace. Right, and then people um, experience things, and things don't turn out well, and they're like, "Man, I just don't understand why things didn't turn out right." Because you know, I had a piece about it, right? And it's like, well, we've got to get to the root of what peace is uh, and how it functions in our life. And so this morning, we're gonna get some practical advice and some practical insight <clears throat> on what it looks like for us uh, to pursue peace, to obtain peace, and the implications of peace in our life. Okay, so Philippians chapter four, verse one is where we're gonna start. We're gonna be verse one to nine. So follow along with me as I read. Paul says this. So then. My dearly loved and longed for brothers and sisters, my joy and crown. In this manner, stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. Now, real quick, Paul does two things here that are really important. The first thing is he points us back to what he just said as a reminder of what he just said, which is in light of the fact that we're citizens of heaven, we're to eagerly await our Savior Jesus, who will transform our lowly, humble bodies into the likeness of his glorious body. So Paul wants us to remember that and kind of take that truth with us. But then secondly, what he does with the words in this manner is he points us forward to the practical application of what it means to walk in this truth. And he's about to lay out the practical application here of what it means to stand firm. So in this manner, stand firm. Well, what manner? How do we stand firm? Paul's about to show us here. All right. So let's look at verse two, where Paul's going to come back to this idea of unity and the importance of unity so that we can stand firm together as he sets up this idea of practical peace as we await Jesus as citizens of heaven. He says this in verse two, I urge you, Eodia, and I urge you, Syndicate, to agree in the Lord. Yes, I also ask you, true partner. Now, true partner is somebody's name most likely here. And so he's asking somebody specifically, true partner, to help these women who have contended for the gospel at my side, along with Clement and the rest of my coworkers whose names are in the book of life. So what's going on here? Well, you've got two women in the church of Philippi, and there's some disunity between these two women. And so Paul's urging them to what? agree in the Lord. Literally, what that word means is to set their mind on the same thing, to think the same way. Now, if you've been paying attention at all, that should sound very familiar at this point because Paul's hit this in every single chapter, this idea of like-mindedness or same-mindedness or thinking the same way, right? And so this idea of thinking the same way 
has been a theme all throughout the book of Philippians, and he's holding that up for Iodia and Syndicate to say, hey, look, y'all have got to be unified together. Remember, Paul's goal is he writes the church in Philippi. He writes this letter to the Philippians. His goal is for their Christian maturity to flourish. He wants them to grow as Christians. And one of the things that he points out, one of the main things he points out, is this whole idea of being united together in the faith, for the faith, and the way that they're to be united together is by having the same mind as Christ did and walking in the same humility as Christ walked in. And so we've known because of the way Paul lays this out that there's been some evidence of division, and now we're seeing it very, very real that there's evidence of division that's happening here in the church in Philippi. And so what Paul's doing is he's calling them to be at peace with one another, right? To be the same mind, to think the same way. This is what Paul's pushing them toward. But I want you to see the grounds, the grounds that he bases this on. So he calls them to unity. He says, agree in the Lord. Here's the, here's the grounds. He grounds it in their identity. He grounds it in their identity. Don't miss this because this is huge, right? He says, agree who? In, agree what? In the Lord. So they're in the Lord together, okay? So that's part of their identity. And their names are in the book of life. And we see that in verse three, meaning this. They're believers. They're Christians. They're Christ followers. They have trusted in the finished work of Jesus. And so their name is in the Lamb's book of life. They have the ability to be in the Lord together as one family. Side note, by the way, I just want to remind you of this. One thing to remember that's really important is that their names are held up as names that are in the book of life. But I think so many times we hear that and we just assume everybody's name is in the book of life. And that's just not true. It is a gift, it is an honor, and it is a privilege that's found in Christ. That's how you get your name in the book of life, is by trusting in the finished work of Jesus. And I think sometimes we forget the reality that there are those whose names are not in the book of life. And I want to be very clear on that. And I also want you to know, for those of you that are listening, this is not something that you earn. You don't earn your name in the book of life by vigorously working or doing good deeds. Uh, you receive your name in the book of life through the finished work of Jesus and by trusting in that. So I don't want to jump over that whole idea of the, the Lamb's book of life and just assume that everybody's name's in there because that's just not true. And in fact, the main mission of the church is knowing God and making him known. And so as the church, our role is to go to people and let them know about the Lamb's book of life, those who've trusted in Jesus, and remind them and hold up for them the hope of the gospel saying that through Christ, through trusting in Christ, you have the opportunity to be able to experience God forever and be united with him, okay? So I just I, let me, I just wanted to hit that really quickly. But back to Iodia and Syndicate, Paul, he grounds um, the call to peace in their identity, and he reminds them of their identity. He's saying, you're on the same team. You're part of the same family. Keep the main thing, the main thing. Let that be the grounds or the foundation for the peace that you're gonna have with one another. Again, he's pointing out the same idea of considering others more important than yourself, being willing to lay down your preferences, your personal agendas for the sake of peace and unity within the church, adopting the same mind as Christ, <laughs> walking in humility, right? Here's what I want you to see in this too, is that the church, the church is the one place that gives us the grounds to actually be able to do that. See, so many people in our culture are trying to establish new entities. Oftentimes, people even think it's pre-existing entities, things like political squares or public places or nonprofits or all these different things. They feel like those are the places that maybe we can get people to agree and find peace. But the truth is the church is the only place, the only real true place that people can actually be different and experience perfect peace together. All right, so here's the first thing that I want you to see as we walk through this idea of peace, and that's this. Peace with one another happens on the foundation of your identity in Christ. Peace with one another happens on the foundation of your identity in Christ. This is why the church is the place for us to be able to be unified, for us to be able to find peace, because the peace that we experience in the church, <clears throat> excuse me, the peace that we experience in the church is based on the identity that we have in Christ. And so, one of the things we've got to understand is that if the enemy is going to attack the church, the easiest way that the enemy can derail the mission of the church is to do what? Stir up division within the church. See, if the enemy stirs up division within the church, then it creates chaos everywhere. Think about it like this. Think about a football team. And they get in the huddle and the play's called and they go to the line of scrimmage and they get ready to snap the ball. And remember, the goal of football is to take that little oblong shape 
figure and get it to the goal line in the hands of somebody on your own team, right? So, so the, the, the football team is trying to move the ball down the field. The goal in the mission is to move the ball down the field and score a touchdown. Well, let's say that the quarterback calls hike and the center and the guard all of a sudden stand up. They don't make their block and they begin to dispute against one another and they're at odds and they're having an argument and they're frustrated back and forth. What do you think is going to happen? The men that they're supposed to block are going to run in and they're going to tackle the quarterback or the running back. The play's not going to be able to get off and, and the mission, the goal is not going to be accomplished. Why? Because two people were at odds with one another. They weren't, they weren't thinking the same way. They weren't of the same mind. There was division there and so the mission failed. The same is true within the church. If there's division within the church, if we're not unified together, if we don't have peace together based on our identity in Christ, then the mission will not continue to move forward through us because we're divided. We have to be united. We have to be unified together. We have to think the same way. We have to remember that we're all part of the same team, that we're part of the same family. We got to keep the main thing the main thing, which means less time on our preferences and more time on reaching people, right? We have to remember the purpose of the church. The purpose of the church is not to cater to consumers. It's to cater to the mission that God's given us, which is to know him and make him known. Y'all, this is huge for us. See, we have to understand that, that we're part of the same family, that we're on the same team, that we've got to be at peace with one another. Now, I want to be clear on this. This doesn't mean that we're dismissive towards sins within the church, right? That would go against the rest of what Paul lays out throughout the New Testament. Paul's very clear on how to address sins within the church. Let me be clear. The point of this passage is not to deal with how we address or confront sin. The point of this passage is, is to point to the importance of us being in the same mind together, to think the same way. That's the point Paul's driving home. He's not trying to address how we deal with sin issues within the church. He's saying, be of the same mind. Keep the main things the main things, right? Would we be a church? Would we be a church that comes from different backgrounds with different opinions and different preferences, and yet we have the same mindset because we all agree in the Lord, Right? We understand that those things, those differences and preferences and opinions, those are not the things that define us. Those are not primary things. Right? Those are secondary things. In fact, I would argue that if you want to put the gospel on display, be a group of people that are radically different, but that agree together on one thing, that agree on one thing. Especially in the world that we live in today, people can't agree on anything. Right? You want to put the gospel on display, you get a bunch of people that are different, that look different, that think different, that have different backgrounds, different pasts, different preferences, but yet they are unified around one purpose, and that is the message and ministry of Jesus. Right? You want to put the gospel on display, that's a way to be able to do that, family. And so what Paul's going to do is he's going to keep moving, and he's going to show us how we create an environment for this to happen. How do we create an atmosphere or a space for peace to be prevalent within the church? So look at verse 4. He says this, rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again, rejoice. Let your graciousness or or gentleness there be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Don't worry about anything, but in everything through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, If you're anything like me, when you first read this, you're thinking, wait a minute, Paul just took a complete left-hand turn here. What's going on? What's happening? This is what's happening here is Paul's trying to show us something. He's trying to point us to something. I want to hold that up for you. And I want to do that like this. Here's the second thing that I want you to see as it relates to this whole idea of peace that we're walking through. It's the second thing you need to see. Vertical peace leads to personal peace. Vertical peace leads to personal peace. Paul says here, he says, rejoice in the Lord, right? It seems like he's kind of making a left-hand turn. He's really not. He's saying rejoice in the Lord. Stop worrying and start trusting. Redirect your eyes from your problems and all these other things to the Lord, which, by the way, is done through prayer, which Paul holds up. Prayer is saying that you can't, but that God can. Prayer is a posture of trust. It's a posture of you saying, I am, uh, I am finite and you're infinite. And so I'm coming to you and I'm asking you to do that which I can't. So rejoice in the Lord. I'm going to focus my attention on him. I'm going to put myself in a posture of trust. And then the result is that the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Okay? So let's talk about this idea of the peace of God for just a minute. 
Because I think this is really important. Paul says that, that we'll experience this, but what exactly does this mean? And then what does it look like played out in our life? Well, let me say this. Peace is something that comes to the person of Jesus, okay? It's not primary, primarily a feeling, it's primarily a person. Now, there are impacts and effects that we gain from the person of Christ, and we'll get there in a little bit, but it is primarily the person of Jesus. Let me show you what I mean. Because we are sinners, all right? We've turned our backs on God. We are rebels. We are children of wrath, is what Ephesians 2 would call us. Um, there is division between us and God. There is, there is not peace between us and God. There is a war raging on uh, because we choose to run in our own lane and turn our backs on God. And so there's no peace between us and God. But God, because he's rich in mercy, because he loves us, he sent Christ to come and live a life that we could have never lived. We talk about this often, so it, in that we get his perfection. And not only does he give us his perfection, but he takes on our punishment, so he dies on the cross for our sins. So what does he do in that? He absorbs that which was meant for us, so he takes on the wrath of God, the wrath of God that we deserve because of our sin. Jesus takes that on. And then he raises from the dead, and through him, we get the chance to have new life and access to God. So Jesus is our peace because he does everything necessary to restore that which was broken between us and God. Where there was no peace, there is now peace. You trace this back to the very beginning of time, right? In, in Genesis, when we look at when God created everything, it was good. There was something called shalom that was present. That's perfect harmony and peace with God and all of creation. The minute that Adam and Eve sinned, that was broken. Shalom, perfect harmony and peace with God and all of creation was gone. It was, it was wiped out, right? Sin distorted and tainted everything. Through Christ, he is restoration for us. He restores us in our brokenness to God. And so shalom is restored through Christ, only through Christ. See, there's, this is the beauty of the cross. It's the beauty of the finished work of Jesus is that there's no way that we could ever restore the peace that once was before sin entered the world. Only Jesus could do that. That's the beauty of the gospel. And, and we can't miss that, right? God didn't owe that to us. Uh, we didn't deserve that. God demonstrates his love in sending Christ to bring perfect peace to us between us and God. Where there was, we were children of, uh, of wrath and we deserved the punishment uh, of God. Where that was the case, it is not the case anymore because of the finished work of Jesus. So because of the finished work of Jesus, we become sons or daughters of, of God. We're part of God's family now. And because we're part of God's family, we have access to the opportunity to have a personal confidence that's found in God, right? Uh, part of God's nature, part of God's uh, character is that of tranquility and, and calmness and serenity. That's part of who God is. We get a chance to experience that because of who we are in Christ, Right? We get the chance to experience through Christ a, a tranquility, a calmness, a serenity that characterizes who God is. We get to partake in those things of the nature of God because we are in Christ. And so because of that, there are things that we get to experience, yes, emotionally and yes, in our confidence, but it doesn't start there. Peace doesn't start with a feeling. It starts with the person of Christ. And through Christ, there are things that we get to experience as a result. Let me try to um, give you a better example here to really drive this home. Uh, my daughter, when she gets scared at night and she screams out, she's having a bad dream or something like that, and, and daddy walks in the room, everything changes. She goes from being fearful and frightened and afraid to all of a sudden, she's got a sudden sense of comfort and calmness and tranquility, and, and she feels confident and safe. Why? Because daddy's there. Now, she can't tell you why she feels that way. Those are just the fruit of daddy being present, right? Because daddy's there, everything's okay. She has a different confidence. She has a, a peace that she's able to experience. The same is true with us in Christ is that we have the chance to have access to our daddy, to God the Father, who in him we get to experience attributes and characteristics of who he is. We get to experience a confidence, and a peace that passes all understanding. And in a lot of ways, we don't know how to comprehend that. We don't know how to write that out, but there is a calmness or a tranquility that comes from resting in who God is. One scholar says it like this, God's peace is like a garrison of soldiers. It will keep guard over our thoughts and feelings so that they will be as safe against the assaults of worry 
and fear as any fortress. I love that picture, right? It's like a a bunch of troops surrounding us that's almost like a fortress against worry and fear. Why? Because our confidence is in God. Our confidence is in who he is and what he's done for us. We recognize that we're children of God. And here's the thing, and I want to make this clear because we we talked about this at the beginning. Peace is not just a warm feeling, that warm fuzzies that you feel all the time, right? It's a distinct confidence in who God is and the fact that he's in control. And the reason that you can have confidence, a distinct confidence in that is because you recognize what he's done for you. And you see what he's done for you in Christ. And so you can trust that he's in control. He he provided for your salvation. I think you can trust him with your circumstances. I think you can trust him in this life. Because you know he's in control, there's a trust that you give him. And the result of that trust in the sovereign God that saved your soul is that, yes, you get to experience an element of tranquility, a calmness, a, a serenity as you submit and surrender to the God that's in control of all things. So it's not just some kind of feeling that you innately feel about some kind of decision. It's a confidence in who holds the keys to the decision that you're trying to make, right? It's one of the things I've heard people say, like, you know, write your plans in pencil and give God the eraser. Uh, there's some, you know, ways you could push against that. There's some weirdness in that. But, but the thing that I like about it is this idea that God's ultimately the one in control and he's where the confidence that I have rests. It's the same thing that we see here in this idea of the peace of God that we get to experience. It originates in Christ and it results in some confidence and tranquility and serenity and calmness inside of us because God's in control. Jesus would say it like this in John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled or fearful. Why? Because God's in control and Jesus himself in John 14 is evidence of that as he's about to go to the cross as evidence of the fact that God's in control, right? God's peace is able to produce exceedingly better results than any kind of human efforts or any kind of planning. It's far superior to any person's schemes or anything that you think you could manipulate or work up. It's way better than any kind of security that you could try to create for yourself, whether financial or personal or whatever the case may be. And it's way more effective for removing any kind of anxiety or worry than any kind of like, you know, earthly thing of like count to 10 and breathe, exhale and read this book or whatever the case may be. It's way more effective for breaking down anxiety and worry than anything else as you reorient your heart and your mind around who God is, right? And I say that because there are, there are some of you today, probably many of you, I, w- I would say probably most of you, given the season that we're in, that you've got to start leaning into the personal peace that Christ purchased for you. You've got to start leaning into the personal peace that Christ purchased for you. In other words, you've got to look at your salvation and the finished work of Jesus and everything that he's accomplished for you as proof for why you can trust God. And as you trust God and turn over control of your life, you will experience the calmness and tranquility and serenity that you so desire, but that you can't find. Some of you have got to start leaning into that. You're going to start leading with the cross, but allowing it to lead you down the path of serenity and tranquility as you hand over everything and say, God, I I do have a sense of calmness because I realize that I can do nothing at this point and I am not in control, but you are. And that is a great place for your trust to be. And in fact, God, I would rather you be in control because if I was in control, there'd be a ton of problems. It'd be Houston. We have a problem every five minutes, but with God who's in control and sovereign over all things, you can trust him. All right. And here's the other thing that you see when you're walking in personal peace, excuse me, when you're walking in personal peace, there's going to be an external effect that comes as a result of that as well. Paul says the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, so we've been talking about, will do what? Guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. There will be an external effect from the guarding of the mind and the heart that happens when you trust in God and you experience the peace of God. And so again, Paul's showing us how to create an environment of peace, an atmosphere of peace. And he's saying, hey, it starts first with you on a personal level of experiencing personal peace, and then that translates externally, right? When we're at rest in the faithfulness of God internally, it's going to manifest itself externally in the way that we relate to other people. And Paul shows us the implications of this here next. I want you to look at verse 8 as he begins to flesh this out even more. He shows us the the external implications that come from this. Verse 8, finally, brothers and sisters, 
By the way, I appreciate Paul. He used the word finally, and he's got a whole lot longer to go. He's just like a good preacher, right? Hey, and in conclusion, and then another 35 minutes, okay? So just, I want you to see where I get this from. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any moral excellence and if there is anything praiseworthy, dwell on these things. Do what you have learned and received and heard from me and seen in me and the God of peace will be with you. The God of peace will be with you. Here's the third and last thing that I want you to see as Paul talks about peace and how we navigate peace, and that's this. The peace of God doesn't produce uh, passivity, but it produces proactiveness. It doesn't make us passive. It makes us proactive. In other words, God's peace doesn't mean complacency. Oh man, I have peace and serenity in God, so I'm just going to sit on my hands and I'm not going to do anything and I'm just going to kind of That would be squandering the peace that God's given you. And that's not the case, and that's not what Paul lays out. This is not freedom to do nothing because you trust in God's peace, right? This is an empowerment to run after Jesus as you trust in God's peace. And you say, well, what does that look like? I'm glad you asked. Paul answers the question. He holds up two things, two specific things. And I'm gonna do it letter A and letter B. These are the the things that he holds up. The, The letter A is focus your mind on the things of Christ. Paul says, focus your mind on the things of Christ. He says, dwell on these things. What things? Whatever's true, whatever's honorable, whatever's just, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, whatever's commendable, if there's any moral excellence, and if there's anything praiseworthy, dwell on those things. And you say, well, those kind of sound moralistic. Not if you understand that they're tethered to verse nine, which Paul says, do what you have learned and received and heard from me. All these things are tethered to Christ, right? Having the same mind of Christ. Everything Paul's been about is to live is Christ. So Paul's drawing and circling the wagons around, circling your mind and your heart around the things of Christ. You say, well, how do I do that? How do I focus my mind on the things of Christ? Well, you do it through the word of God like we're doing now. You read it, you saturate it yourself in it, you hang it on your walls and you meditate on it day and night is what God's word says. For I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. We've got to have the word of God to focus our mind on the things of Christ. For some of us, uh, we want to know how to focus our minds on the things of Christ, and yet we don't know the things of Christ. And the reason why we don't know the things of Christ is we don't get in the words of Christ that have been given to us in Scripture. The Word of God is vital to the Christian life. How else do we do it? Well, the people of God. How do we do it to the people of God? Well, they encourage us with the things of Christ. They encourage us and challenge us and hold us accountable to keeping our minds focused on Jesus. When we start, when we start wanting to go off the rails and, and we're just consumed with our job or uh, overly consumed with our families or our careers or money or whatever else, say, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. Remember to live as Christ. Uh, adopt the same mind as Christ. Remember who Jesus is, right? We need the people of God to exhort us with the word of God and the truths of God to keep our minds focused on the things of Christ. Here's the next thing, letter B. Paul shows us this. Keep putting into practice the ways of Christ. Keep putting into practice the ways of Christ. He says this in verse nine, do what you have learned and received and heard from me and seen in me. So put these things into practice, right? This is not being passive. This is not just kind of sitting back. This is putting these things into practice. Well, how do you do that? Well, again, you've got to know what they are. So we've got to meditate on the word of God and we need people with us to encourage us. We need the people of God. What this means, family, is that you need the church. You need the church to be able to live out what Paul's pointing us to. We have to have people around us in this. Philippi needed this. Paul himself needed this. We need this together. And with that, as the church, y'all, we have to be unified together in peace, and we have to create an atmosphere and environment of peace around one purpose, and that's knowing God and making him known. And I know for some of you people, you're like, eh, that feels like two. It's actually one because you can't have one without the other. So it's one specific thing because they're woven together. Would we be a church that walks in the peace of God both corporately and personally? And would the peace of God fuel the way that we live our life? Would it fuel the the setting our mind on the things of Christ? Would it it fuel uh, practicing the things of Christ? See, when your, your confidence is in the person of Jesus, it motivates and changes the actions in the way that we live. And so would that be true for us? Would we understand that peace with one another happens on the foundation of our identity in Christ? 
Will we understand that vertical peace leads us to personal peace that we get the chance to experience? And would we understand that the peace of God does not produce passivity, but it produces proactiveness in our lives? And would we, like Paul, run after Jesus? And would that characterize our lives? For some of you, you're, you're listening this morning and you've never experienced any kind of peace with God. And, and for you, it's gonna start by trusting in Jesus for the very first time and receiving peace. Because right now, as you sit, you're an enemy of God. And you need desperately the peace that's offered in Christ. And so I want to encourage you before this day ends, as I pray here in just a minute, surrender your life to Christ. Trust in the finished work of Jesus, the life and the death and the resurrection that gives you the peace of God so that you can have access to that in every single day life that you live in. Let me pray for us. God, we love you. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your kindness. God, we thank you for the peace that we get to experience. Peace in our relationship with you and the fruit of that peace in everyday life. Would we be a church that's characterized by an atmosphere and an environment of peace as we seek it with one another and as we allow the peace that you've given us to motivate us in the way that we live. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. Hey, Mitch family, we're so glad that you were able to join us this Sunday. As some of you may already know, we've started to roll out our regathering plans. And starting July 19th, we'll start walking into phase two. We would love it if you could go to our website at imageatl.com and fill out a really quick hosting application form. We're looking to put together some house gatherings or watch parties where we can come together in groups of 10 to 12 so that we can practice safe social distancing and watch Sunday gatherings together. Be sure to stick around and visit our website for more information. This culture. This culture today, the chaos, the conflict, the confusion, the opposition, the things that are going on around us, the way that we function as a church is by pursuing love at all costs. It's by using the gifts that God's given us for the purpose of serving other people. And it's by being about God's glory. our lives down because he's laid his life down for us. Hey Image family, this is James Martin and this is many of you know is the first week of the Love Your Neighbor movement that we are doing as a church. I'm really excited about this movement because it's essentially giving me the opportunity to do a lot of the things that I had already been eager to do in terms of knowing my area and knowing the people who lived around me. So um, this first week was about knowing your neighborhood and so I made a map of my street and wrote down the names of some of the people um, in my street on the back of my phone bill and prayed over them. And a few weeks ago in community group, the question came up of whether this is creepy. And, you know, I think about as a single person, the dating world, there's uh, a creepy way to date somebody and there's a non-creepy way to date somebody. You can stalk somebody or you can talk to them and get to know them. And so um, making a map of my street to me was a helpful visual. Um, to remember people who I'd already had conversations with and to remember them in prayer and essentially to remember that it's not like I want something from them or that we want anything from them, but we want to give them something. We have the hope of the gospel and we have the life of Jesus and his spirit inside of us. And so um, we have something really, really wonderful to give them. And if they already know Jesus, then we can essentially um, share our common joy in Jesus together. And so um, I really hope that's an encouragement to everyone. Um, and I'm excited to see where we go as a church as we continue to love our neighbors. We want to thank you for joining us online today. We hope you were encouraged in your faith and challenged to grow deeper in your walk with God through the message this morning. If you responded to the gospel today, or if you have any questions or would like to take the next steps to get connected, we want to follow up with you. Just text the word CONNECT to the number on the screen and someone will be in touch with you soon. If you are in need of help, or if you would like some additional resources during this time, we are here for you. 
please visit our page at imageatl.com. If you have been blessed by any of our online resources, please consider giving to continue supporting the ministries of Image Church. You can give through the Image Church app or at imageatl.com give. We were not created to walk through life alone. We need each other. Our community groups are places where we learn, laugh, and live as a family. These groups remind us that we aren't alone and we are better together. All of our groups are now meeting virtually and we would love for you to get connected. You can do that at imageatl.com slash community groups. Make sure to follow us on social media and we look forward to our next virtual gathering.